My dear Sherlock, I expect you and Dr. Watson to join me at the club immediately upon receipt of this note. According to my calculations, that should be at 11.40 a.m. Your brother, Mycroft. To see Mr. Mycroft home. Uh, right you are, sir. He's expecting you in the upstairs study. I've worked with some legendary directors. Come in. But always in small parts. I've worked since in major roles with some remarkable directors. Steven Spielberg, Joe Dante, John Landis, Tim Burton, Peter Jackson, George Lucas. An actor can't ask for more. But the one thing that changed my life completely as an actor was the experience I had in 1970, where I worked for the greatest director I've ever worked for, Billy Wilder. I need to say no more. He wasn't a particularly attractive character, Sherlock Holmes. He had an incredible brain, and it was basically, um, well, used in the solution of problems which had defeated everybody else. Usually, almost always, of course, the expense of Scotland Yard and the unfortunate inspector of the Strad. There's nothing he couldn't do, nothing. Intellectual brilliance, extremely intolerant of many things and many people. Aggressive, um, arrogant at times, very much aware of his own brilliance, totally courageous, nothing frightened him, and an expert in just about everything you can think of, whether it was at 250 different varieties of tobacco ash, or whether it was the famous um, essay that he wrote on the polyphonic motents of Lassus. So his knowledge was music, he played the violin, of course, as we all know. His enormous knowledge of drugs, his knowledge of tobacco ash, his knowledge of uh, fighting. He had a terrific straight left. He could knock anybody out, and did on occasions. Add to that the brain of an Einstein, practically, and what you really have is Superman uh, for that particular period. He was based definitely on Dr. Joseph Bell. I mean, there's no question about that, of Edinburgh, whose powers of deduction, I guess this is it, of course, were second to none. And he actually used to go through all this with his students. And he would say, well, now, look, there's a man who's coming in to see us, or go to the window and look at that man or that woman in the road, etc., etc., etc. Tell me what you deduct from, or deduce rather, from their appearance. There's the very famous scene in the story of the Greek interpreter where Mycroft and Sherlock are standing at the window of the Diogenes Club, and a man is walking down the street, and each one of them tries to top the other by saying, you know, he's so-and-so. Yes, but before that, and after that, yes, married, yes, with only one child, or whatever, I can't remember the, the words, but Sherlock actually always admitted that Mycroft was the brains of the family, so the mind boggles at the mind and the genetic ability and genius of Mycroft Holmes, who, of course, was the power behind the throne. But it definitely is something that comes out, of course, in the private life of Sherlock Holmes in the film, that he was the power behind the throne and ran the country from the Diogenes Club, virtually. But that's my affinity with Sherlock Holmes, because he is one of the unique characters in all fiction. I mean, 221B Baker Street doesn't exist in reality. You, if you go to Baker Street, it's actually the Abbey National. But I'm told that there is somebody there who takes care of the correspondence that comes to Sherlock Holmes to this day, because there are some people who really do believe that he existed. Uh, I've heard lots of reasons given for the use of the two names. Uh, I knew Adrian Conan Doyle one of the sons. Adrian Conan Doyle was kind enough to tell me that he thought that 
I played Holmes as well as anyone he'd ever seen, and that was after that perfectly dreadful film that I did in the very early 60s in Berlin, where when they, although I shot it in English, when they dubbed it, if you like, in English, or looped it, ADR'd it in English, they didn't use me, they, didn't, they used another person's voice, which is the height of idiocy, but then that sort of thing goes on in the industry. Now, Adrian told me that the name Sherlock and the name Holmes were both taken from cricketers who played for perhaps a minor, as we call it in this country, a minor county, or perhaps not even that. They might have just been amateurs who played village green crickets. And one of them was called Sherlock, and the other was called Holmes, and Arthur Conan Doyle knew them. Now, I don't know if that's true, but that's the story that I was told by his son. The Deadly Necklace. That was the first time I played Holmes. The Dr. Watson was Thorley Walters. He was superb. We had some very good German actors, all of whom spoke very good English. All had to be dubbed into English, of course. We had an art director who made the best-looking Baker Street set I've ever seen. And Terence Fisher was the director. I think it's one of the best things I've ever done in terms of playing Sherlock Holmes. I played him twice subsequently for Harmony Gold in two full-length films, which were then cut in half almost for television. No comment necessary, because they didn't make sense. One was Sherlock Holmes and the Leading Lady, where the lady, the woman, comes in. Uh, and it's a plot to assassinate the Emperor Franz Josef of Austria. Holmes uncovers it. There are those Sherlock Holmes in the incident of Victoria Falls, where he went to Zimbabwe. Certainly wouldn't do that now. And uh, they were both very good. Uh, Holmes is sent by King Edward VII to South Africa to pick up the Star of Africa, which is a real diamond, which exists today in the Tower of London in the Crown Jewels. Not made up. So I take it and it's stolen. And we end up in Victoria Falls with all the suspects. Claude Aikens played Theodore Roosevelt. It's a wonderful shot of him and me sitting on the front of, an inn, of a train. On the front as it's going, uh, chatting away quite happily. And um, very great fun to do and very good. And then they go and cut it in half for television. The Watson was the first person I ever appeared with on the stage in my life, at the age of 10 or 11, Patrick McNee. Still very much with us. A few months older than me, which I never cease to impress upon him. But we are the same age at the moment. From the sound of your footsteps, I gather that you were not in a particularly amiable mood. There's one thing that I noticed the other day when I was looking at the Hunt of the Baskervilles, the black and white one, with Rathbun, which I found quite incredible, because I don't know when it was made, but it must have been very late 30s or very early 40s. It could have been made during the war, I don't know. It's the most extraordinary thing when you consider that particular period of history, even compared with today. The film comes to an end, everything's been cleared up, and Holmes has the cast grouped around him in Baskerville Hall, and he explains what has happened, why it's happened, who's responsible. When he does that, he stalks away from the group towards a door, which he opens, and the last line of the film, unless I'm greatly mistaken, he turns towards Dr. Watson and says, Watson, the needle. Extraordinary. Well, I played Holmes three times. I mean, people would practically keel over if there was so much as a, a sniff, even though it might have been just blowing your nose. Oh, no, 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 we can't have anything like that. Oh, no, 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 it's out of the question. You've painted me as a hopeless dope addict just because I occasionally take a 5% solution of cocaine. A 7%... It is sort of skirted around in the books. 
in the stories, because there are both stories and books, complete stories in one book, like The Valley of Fear and things like that. Uh, but, I mean, Conan Doyle, of course, had enormous medical knowledge, and Holmes was based on Dr. Joseph Bell, who was a doctor. So he brought it in. I don't know why, but he did. And, uh, well, the world knows. But in that day and age, to bring that line in was absolutely astounding, and I'm sure I'm right. Quite. And speaking of Belgium, it has come to my attention that you are interested in the whereabouts of a certain engineer. When I played Mycroft Holmes, Billy wanted me to be totally unrecognizable, which meant a bald cat makeup and all sorts of things, which takes hours and is very tiresome. But I certainly did look different, and he wanted me to play Mycroft. I'd already seen George Sanders, who told me this, who wanted to play it, and I gather he'd also seen Laurence Olivier. But I ended up playing it. In a sense, it changed my life, because if I can play in the Billy Wilder film, which is basically, to a certain extent, a mixture of light comedy and very serious, I can work for anyone in anything. Provided I'm right for the part, of course. It changed my career, and that's 30 plus years ago. So how could people possibly say after that, or still say, that I was or am typecast? People who say that haven't done their homework. The people who say that don't know what they're talking about. People who say that shouldn't be in this business, because it isn't true. And the proof is on the screen. What a vivid imagination my brother has. At the age of five, by carefully observing a neighbor's house, he deduced that babies were brought not by the stork, but by the midwife. But I am the only actor in history who has played both brothers, and probably will always be. And I played Mycroft Holmes, brother of Sherlock, played by Robert Stevens. Colin Blakely was Dr. Watson. They were magnificent. I thought the film was a superb film. I didn't see the bits that were put in later on laser because there were at least two other stories. The first one about the ballerina who wants Holmes to father a child. And the second, of course, about Loch Ness, the monster and Queen Victoria and all that. And anything that anybody says about Loch Ness, I can believe. It is a grim place. Believe me, it is. If there's something there, I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised. It's a vast stretch of cold, still, dark water. If you're shooting at night, it's even more ominous, which we were, the exteriors. We had to reshoot quite a bit of it in the studio at Pinewood. Because the cameraman, the director of photography, Christopher Chalice, was one of the best we've ever had. When they saw the rushes taken at Urquhart Castle with Loch Ness in the background, it was just dead black. And he said, Mr. Wilder, I can't light Loch Ness. So they did a bit of it in the studio, walking up the grassy knoll to the tent. Mr. Ashdown, I presume? And behind, in the studio, were sort of lights suggesting water and the lock and everything. I don't think it will. Look. The only time Billy ever referred to my past, very funny, he never spoke to me about it, ever. Ever. Never since, either. It's because he did say, I'm not interested in what you may have done. I'm only interested in whether you are the right actor to play Mycroft Holmes in my film. And of course, I.L. Diamond, his Diamond, was also very much involved because he'd written it with Billy. They made the decision. I didn't do a test. But when we were on Loch Ness and it was dark, there were bats flying around from time to time. And Billy did turn to me once and once only, and I, kind of a sideways look, and say, I guess you must feel quite at home here. But that was the only time he ever, ever, ever said it. Never again greatest director I've ever worked with. And many people will consider, without any doubt, one of the greatest directors of all time in the cinema. Nobody could argue with that.